investigate women's health, sexual health, and marginalised populations. The research focuses on investigating conditions of communication and relational skills. Her aim is to identify interactions that foster the ongoing clinical engagement of vulnerable and marginalised populations. It's my great uh, pleasure and privilege to have been invited here by the Sexual Health Society to speak to you capturing 20 years of practice. And I'm particularly grateful to uh, funding from the Hoopies Foundation and the initiative of Claire Hurst to bring me here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been a lecturer at Massey University since 2010 and my area of research is women's health and sexual health and I'm particularly interested in marginalised and vulnerable populations. And uh, my, my strong background is in uh, nursing and midwifery and I began working at the sexual health service in 1996. I still find it fascinating that we live in such a highly sexualised society and yet talking about sexual health is still such a no-no. This was brought home to me yet again when I was in Koru Lounge. Um, earlier this year I was talking with a couple of colleagues uh, who don't work in this field of sexual health and they were asking me about my doctoral research and I was explaining that I was exploring women's experiences of genital herpes and the human papilloma virus and how genital herpes impacts on women's lives. And I became quite enthusiastic about this and I could see my colleagues becoming quite uncomfortable. And in the end, one of them said, Catherine, keep your voice down. And I pretended to be naive and I said, why? And he said, because people are staring at us. And I said, well, that's a really good thing because people need to hear herpes and genital warts and HPV talked about. So even in this first two minutes before you go to sleep, this is a key take home message. When we talk about sexual health, of course, unless it's a private and confidential issue, when you go home and say there was this great woman talking about herpes, you don't go, there was this great woman talking about you know, you just keep your voice tone normal. And this is the same when we're talking to people as well. Not using that dropping of voice that indicates that we are now talking about a special topic. We need to make sexuality and sexual health an open, ordinary topic that's talked about. So that's my first public service announcement. <laughs> being a midwife at National Women's, uh, where for the most part, women's <coughs> bodies were celebrated, sexuality, here was a baby. You know, it was wonderful. I had so many photos taken with proud families. How many photos do you think I had taken with my sexual health clients in the time <laughs> I worked there? And yet, it's about the same thing, isn't it? It's all about bodies and what we do with them. And yet, the context is everything and makes such a difference. And uh, I just used this image of, um, from a Time magazine. Some of you won't be aware that in 1982, Time put out this horrendous uh, investigative journalism piece about herpes that continued to have uh, repercussions for years in people's lives because of the inaccuracies within it. So look, that was back in 1996 that I started working at Sexual Health and fast forward uh, to the present day. Uh, we've got this woman coming out about having genital herpes. Isn't this fascinating that in 2015 those people who will actually speak up about having her herpes are so few and far between that they are national and international news worthy. I think this is so important to be aware of that I think I'm pretty convinced that more people speak up about having HIV than they do about having herpes, which is such an irony. 
Again, the comedian Amy Schumer in her conversation with God, and God saying, yes, 70% of my calls are about herpes scares. <laughs> so, you know, it's a really funny YouTube clip, but again, it, it underscores this irony that we've got this endemic virus that continues to be like the bogeyman. So in this brief presentation, I'm not covering the facts of herpes and herpes, and um, human papilloma virus, but having the right facts are integral to giving good advice. And I've had the privilege of working uh, in collaboration with a number of other people led by Claire to update uh, the Herpes website recently, and it's a beautiful and easily accessible piece. And the same with the, uh, the HPV uh, website. <coughs> So I've been interested for years in why giving biomedical facts doesn't make a difference. And it doesn't make a difference for all sorts of things. People's lived experience is much bigger and different from the biomedical information. So that information is vital and there's a whole other piece. And that whole other piece requires that empathic counselling um, that was being spoken about this morning by Christine. So when I was, in 2004, I was a novice presenter at uh, one of the sexual health clinics, uh, one of the sexual health conferences, 2004. A senior venereologist came up to me as I was about to go in to give my presentation about counselling and herpes. And he said, he said to me, Catherine, I won't be coming to your presentation. Just tell them to get over it. And so this, you know, that uh, quite spurred my interest. So I'm grateful for that because I've spent a number of years, you know, just really digging into why the get over it doesn't particularly work. <laughs> One of the things that fascinates me, it's not just about sexual health diagnoses, it's any diagnoses that are, that are the bread and butter of experts' work. Well, it's marvellous to be an expert because you know so much about your topic, but whenever we're an expert, we are also blinded to the extent to which our topic is utterly weird and peculiar to most of the people encountering that topic. <laughs> so experts need to be able to cope with the, ble the bread and butter of the work. You can't cope with having a huge emotional response to everything you do, but we need to be able to notice this gap that our world is very odd and extraordinary to other people. People have a huge misunderstanding about epidemiology. I recently had an email from a professional woman, a midlife woman, who was devastated with the, being diagnosed with herpes. She was saying, what are the chances? One in a million, and it was me. And I sent her a very warm email back, including the point that actually once you take in uh, HSV-1, which can cause facial cold sores and can be transferred through oral sex to the genital area, and HSV-2, at her midlife age, she probably had a one in three chance. Now here's an otherwise highly educated person completely unaware, and I think that's because we don't make our public service announcements about how common these viruses are. And in 2006, I gave a presentation at another sexual health conference uh, called Heroes Don't Have Herpes. I had a different bond. I'm very, I'm very fond of this current bond, and I'm looking forward to his latest movies, but he still doesn't have herpes either. And he still doesn't negotiate safer sex. He always has spontaneous sex, and it's unprotected, and there's no sign of the words you use or the negotiation that takes place. So I think it's important not to get grumpy with people when they don't know how to talk to a partner about safer sex. There's so little role modeling of, well, what words would you use and how would you say it? And, uh, and yet there's an ever-increasing amount of sexualized information that is completely out of keeping with the sort of sexual health negotiation that we're encouraging people to do. A lot of this uh, conference has been about health promotion and uh, health literacy. One of the wonderful things about doing uh, 
email nurse counselling is that people will put into email what they can't put into words face to face. So I've been able to enlighten people at least a little about the confusion they have about all sorts of things. Like one man emailed me, he thought he had this breakthrough idea about herpes cure because he'd, he'd read about the virus living in the ganglion at the base of the spine. So why hadn't anyone thought of doing surgery to remove those nerves and then the virus would be gone? Not realising that one would be um, crippled and incontinent for the rest of his life. <laughs> You know, but bless, people are trying to figure these things out and they are so wildly confused. <laughs> Another example of wild confusion, this couple, the woman had contracted genital herpes through receiving oral sex from her male partner, type 1, so he's not going to contract it back again. That's the way it goes. So they were having sex. He was wearing his wife runs, his penis poked through the gap mm -hmm. with a condom on. And what did I think about that? And were there any latex suits you could wear all over your body? <laughs> so, you know, quite extraordinary ideas. Now, one of the things that's been fascinating about being an email nurse counsellor is that people email me, I noticed this pattern. People would go to see a health professional and immediately email me to ask all the questions that they didn't ask their healthcare provider. So you have to get that this is a rarefied <coughs> audience who ask questions and give advice about anything other than penetrative heterosexual sex. The questions that people most ask about that their health provider doesn't initiate is talking about oral sex. People really, really, really want to know about oral sex. And so it's so important to talk about oral sex and anal sex. I've, I've had emails from people who assume that because the anal area is so dirty anyway that it's fine for bugs to go there. So, you know, the confusion is staggering. Now, out at dinner last night, Margaret Sparrow said her only disappointment in the conference was that she had not yet heard the word masturbation. So I don't know if any of you have mentioned it, but I promised her I would mention masturbation today. <laughs> and, and to say that people also want to know about masturbation if they're going to pass these viruses to other parts of their body. Because again, people absolutely don't understand that they are safe to touch themselves and they're not going to have herpes all over their body or warts all over their bodies. So please, oral, anal, masturbation. <laughs> people have the most bizarre ideas about how the virus is transmitted. It's not just the toilet seat. You know, I have been asked so many times if you can contract it in a hot pool or in a swimming pool. And I have even been asked if you can swim in the same lake as somebody who has perfect. <laughs> so keep up that education. Really important to let women know that you can have a baby <coughs> when you have genital herpes, that millions of women worldwide have babies safely, even if they're not in the baby having a time of their life at that moment, if they've heard that one sentence for you and that we have great information on our website about safely having babies. Really important that women don't miss out on having babies because they're terrified of having a diseased baby. On the Herpes website we developed a a special page for parents because I got so many emails from parents terrified of contaminating their child and the terror was leading to all sorts of really sad parenting practices like changing nappies, wearing gloves. You know, this is a woman who did not realise that the virus isn't crawling through your whole body and oozing out of your hands, you know, they just get so confused. Uh, washing clothes separately, uh, using hand sanitising till their skin's red and raw, not bathing with their child, um, getting into really weird toilet cleaning behaviours. 
So just so important to assure parents that they can snuggle in bed. So many parents terrified that the virus is creeping across the sheets uh, onto their baby. So really important to normalise that. You will all be aware, but many people are not, that of course when we're advising people, talk to your partner about the virus, we have to make sure that it's safe for them to do that. And for some people, it distinctly is not. They are going to get bashed, they're going to get accused of having an affair. And um, you, similarly to me, many of you will have had experiences where the woman probably contracted the virus from their partner, and yet that partner will give them the bash if they dare to speak up about it. Uh, so just really assessing that. And because of uh, the connotations of sex and sin, people often expect to contract a virus if they've done something that has gone against their preferred values. And again, people imagine, they don't realise that the skin has to rub, that there has to be skin-to-skin -skin rubbing. They imagine from a 10-second lap dance that the virus is going to leap onto their body. So again, a lot of education with people who are feeling remorse for what they're involved in. I think it's so important to make public service announcements about the HPV vaccine, what a fabulous vaccination it is. Uh, I understand why it's been uh, promoted as an anti-cancer vaccine rather than a sexual health vaccine, but I still think that that's a really sad thing. I've promoted the vaccine to my own children as a sexual health vaccine and I talk to parents about what a fabulous opportunity it is to talk to your kids about sexual health. My 12 year old daughter who says, well oh, mum, I won't be needing that for at least 12 years <laughs> as she's about to get her second jab. So, and my son, Pākehā at a desert of 10 school saying, mum, I'm the only boy I know who has this. You know, and these are privileged kids with all sorts of devices, and yet their parents are not giving them one of the greatest gifts they could possibly give them. So I think, you know, the Pākehā in uptake has been poor, and I think it's really important for us to uh, speak up. People will listen to us as health professionals when we talk about the real world and understand the challenges that they are going to potentially not always face and rather than just imagining that the facts will fix everything. As you will be aware that first diagnosis, particularly of genital herpes, can be a deal breaker in terms of how somebody adjusts to the diagnosis. So it's a, so often unfortunately people don't have a good experience first time and they have a stigmatising experience from the health professional and so that really sets them up uh, to feel really shamed about it. And even when people do have a positive experience, they may well experience some grief about it. One woman, uh, she talked about how the nurse called her flower. And I think having genital herpes and being called flower, you know, just that it stood out, as Christine talked about this morning, when people feel traumatised, they vividly remember the kind words that are said to them, or the not kind words. <coughs> and she was saying, this was a young woman, and she had a lovely experience, and she was saying, personally, I left like, I had been given life changing news and whilst they were helpful and supportive at the clinic, I felt very scared and alone with my thoughts and worries when I left. So just knowing we can bridge that gap, but we're not entirely influential, that that 15 to half hour appointment is, it's an important drop in the bucket, but then the person has to go out and face the reality of their lives. I think it can be helpful to understand that certainly not everybody, but some people will experience a diagnosis of HSV or HPV as a grief. A lot of it depends on context, how they came to contract the virus, family beliefs and values about sexuality hugely shape the meaning that's made. 
And this concept of disenfranchised grief is really important. Disenfranchised griefs are those griefs that people can't talk about publicly and mourn. And so if you've got a twisted ankle, you get a lot of support and get to talk it through, get a lot of advice and support. But because people aren't speaking up about these viruses, they're just all in their own head, getting in a muddled mess, which is why the clinical appointment is so important. <clears throat> Normalising using the facts, incredibly helpful. I think though, rather than launching into the facts, it's really helpful to ask the question of what is of the greatest concern to you? Because there are a lot of facts about these viruses, and if the person's trying to sift through, and maybe their question is really, am I going to pass this on to my baby? That might be their biggest concern, not how to tell the partner. So it's helpful to start with that question, rather than start with a load of information. Those people who struggle with these diagnoses often feel like problem patients. One woman said her GP would sigh when she came into the room. And so I think understanding about the disenfranchised group, understanding about uh, the ways people make meaning of their body, that uh, is so much about having this perfect uh, streamlined body now that we are all to some degree tyrannised by uh, what a body should be. And so these viral uh, infections can add to that. I feel enormously concerned that sexual health services are on the progression to becoming a secondary rather than a primary service because I don't think that there anything can replace the comfort that sexual health professionals have about talking about uh, sexual health. And there's so much education that needs to be done in the broader general public, um, in the general practices. And this is an example, so it's a subtle example. So this doctor probably thinks that they're doing a great job, but actually they're not. And this astute woman noticed it. She was describing uh, having these swabs taken. She took a swab test for a number of STIs and she acted like she was apologising for even suggesting that it was done. So what's the message there, that if you get an STI you're a slut? Does she honestly believe that women don't have sex until they have a serious relationship? No, she doesn't. She's just scared to talk about sex. So, and another woman talked about how disconcerting it was for her. The health professional knew nothing about the sexual relationship in which she contracted herpes and the professional said, gosh, he's a real bastard for having given you that. And that is so unhelpful uh, because then what it does is it moralizes these endemic infections. And, and yet that is, a, you know, the health professional probably thought that they were saying a kind and supportive thing, but it actually is incredibly unhelpful. One of the things I've noticed repeatedly across uh, three studies now, women with HSV and HPV, women having gynae exams, women being diagnosed with endometrial <coughs> cancer, is that gender matters in all sorts of ways and that I don't have time to go into. But the key thing is that I've repeatedly noticed that if women have a negative experience with a woman health professional, they believe that that woman was unprofessional and they go to a different woman. If a woman has a negative sexual health, gynecological health experience with a male practitioner, they assume it's because of gender and they won't see a man. So I think it's so important for those of you in clinical practice to really support your male colleagues to do a great job every time and to make sure that men are trained really well in working with women in this area because, uh, you know, women repeatedly would describe a one-off experience with a man and ironically they would go on to describe other experiences with women but that didn't uh, colour the experience in that same way. Part of my study was looking at condom use 
And it is very fascinating after women have been diagnosed with HSV or HPV, uh, they may or may not get a partner to use a condom, but that doesn't mean they're speaking about sexual health. So I think that's so important when we're promoting condom use, not to think that that means also people are talking about sexual health. People are sometimes using condoms to not talk about sexual health. So they need support to talk about sexual health. When talking to women about condom use, I recommend always asking in a heterosexual situation, does your male partner use condoms? Because that acknowledges the power relation rather than saying, do you use condoms? And it opens up a conversation for women to talk about how easy or difficult it is to negotiate and asking uh, questions about how safe it is to ask because literature shows that our partners can be assaulted for asking their partner to use condoms. And the, stati the statistics show that condom use is erratic and uh, drops off significantly. So making sure that people know that you know that condom use is really consistent and keeping the door open for them coming back. I'm nearly there. All right. As part of my study uh, looking at uh, women and, uh, and gynaecological examinations, and the reason I did this study was, I led this study was when I did my doctoral research, what was so interesting was that women had often had a really good relationship with their healthcare provider and going for smears until something was wrong with the genital area and then it all fell apart and they came to know their health professionals' true values and beliefs about STIs and such like. So I, want, I knew that sexual health clinicians did a fabulous job at gynae exams. So in this study we interviewed uh, health professionals who knew women came back to them repeatedly for examinations and we saw, and we interviewed women who had seen those health professionals asking why they came back. And um, we were particularly interested to know about Māori women because we were interested to know about access and reducing disparities. And what we found links in uh, very well with this model that was developed to teach Otago University students. Uh, it's called the Hui model, and it was developed to teach Pākehā practitioners how to work effectively with, with Māori. And the authors acknowledge that, you know, the model is not necessarily the whole journey in the map, but it's very helpful. And what Māori women described that made them come back was these particular health professionals welcomed them. And it wasn't just the health professionals, it was the whole service, including the people at the reception and the front desk, looking up, making eye contact, kia ora, welcome, where to sit. So that time for mihi, time for whanaunatanga, time to become known to each other enough so that a depth of contact had been established in a holistic way. This included health professionals remembering such things from a previous meeting, such as somebody's mother had died. So not diving straight into the kaupapa of what brings you here, and not imagining necessarily that you know why somebody's come, because they may have come for a reason different than you imagine. And uh, the potapota aki, always leaving a door open of how to come back, how to recontact the service, making sure services are really user friendly and don't have disastrous uh, pre-designated appointments and then people are DNAing and such like, and, and practices that are shaming and make it difficult for people to come back. I've put that clock at the centre because what came through so clearly in my research with uh, clinicians who women love to come back to, they would repeatedly say, Catherine, it takes time. Cultural safety takes time. So I have a tremendous concern that we have so much about cultural safety at the level of legislation and policy, and yet with care rationing, practitioners are given an invidious task of trying to be culturally safe without the time it requires. 
And so what happens is that even very good uh, practitioners, when they are pressed into a 10 to 15 minute appointment, will pretty much skip through the mihi, the whanaunatanga, go to the kaupapa, as if this is time saving. And you will all know that it's not time saving at all because you don't hear the whole story, you don't put things in place. But I found this a really helpful model. Uh, I have a list of publications and there are a number of people who are attending this conference whose voices are represented uh, within these articles about um, the extraordinary work they are doing in advocating for women, but they never have time to write themselves. So that's part of what has motivated me to engage in academic study. I finished with this Māori proverb, and I think it's so important for each of us to realise that what we may think is a small contribution to somebody's life is incredibly precious, and we must really value and treasure uh, the work that we do on behalf of others in the area of sexual health. So thank you. While the panel convened, I'm just going to take this opportunity um, to present Catherine with this very small token in recognition of our regret that she's leaving. Uh, leaving not as in leaving the area because her research continues in extraordinary ways and I hope she'll come back to another conference and present what she's currently working on which is sexual talent. I'm looking, I'm looking at intimacy and sexuality and residential aged care so I'm paving the way for our futures. <laughs> So, thank you, Catherine, for your 20 years of friendship and support. And the Catherine has been um, replying, uh, I mean, in all her other work, she's got two teenage children, senior lecturer, doing all this research. For years, she's been doing all the email responses to the herpes emails that come in from the website, from all over the world, from New Zealand, but from all over the world. We can't do ones now from the rest of the world. We haven't got the resources but she also was on our international board of Herpes Alliance and has literally answered, what, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of emails. I'm quite um, 2,000 hours. Yeah, with, with the resonating themes of what you've heard today. So while herpes is common and it's mostly asymptomatic, it still can upset people's lives psychologically, so that's our message. Thank you.